Coming up on DTNS, it's your move, Microsoft, because Sony just bought Bungie. Spotify deals with some artist fallout. And where does the smart home go from here? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, January 31st, 2022. From Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. From lovely Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Rich Straffolino. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Before we started the show on Good Day Internet, we were talking about all sorts of things, like when older dogs don't like younger dogs all that much. <laughs> if you want to get that wider conversation, do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Of course, we want to give a big thanks to our top patrons, including James C. Smith, Miranda Janelle, and Justin Zellers. Now, let's start with a few tech things you should know. The virtualization and cloud computing company Citrix announced it agreed to be taken private by Vista Equity Partners and Evergreen Coast Capital in a $16.5 billion deal. The private equity firms plan to combine Citrix with a 2014 acquisition of the analytics platform Tibco, offering this as a combined software as a service solution. Apple now allows developers to publish unlisted apps on the App Store. These can be shared with private links and won't appear in search. This isn't meant to be a replacement for its test flight beta system, and there's no invite-only mechanism for unlisted apps. Developers can request to move published apps to unlisted, though, if they so desire. Meta paused new users from joining its CrowdTangle social media tracking tool, although new users can still be added to existing company accounts, just not net new users. Meta disbanded the CrowdTangle team last year, moving the tool under its new data and transparency team. The company said staff constraints from reorganization is the reason they're pausing registration. Pinterest expanded its AR shopping features, now working with retailers like Crate and Barrel, Walmart, West Elm, and Wayfair to offer 80,000 shoppable pins that can be virtually placed in homes through its lens camera. Once viewing an item, users can proceed to purchase it directly through that retailer. This is part of Pinterest's try-on AR efforts, which have previously focused on beauty products. Pinterest says that users are five times more likely to buy from try-on enabled pins than standard pins from retailers. And the iOS App Store and Android app markets operated by Tencent and Huawei no longer list the dating app Grinder in China. App reachers at Kimai noted that the iOS version was removed on January 27th. It's unclear when Android apps were pulled. 9to5Mac sources say the iOS app was removed by Grinder's parent company. Grinder users in China have reported issues with the app over the past several weeks, things like not being able to send or receive messages or add likes. Competitive uh, LGB, uh, LGB, uh, LGBTQ dating apps remain available in the country. Grinder was sold to the Chinese video game development company Kunlun Tech to a group of U.S.-based investors in March 2020. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some stuff that went down over the weekend, uh, particularly if you're a Spotify user. Because if you are a Spotify user who enjoys the music of, say, Neil Young or Joni Mitchell, you probably know about the current drama that's happening on the platform. If you're not up to speed, we'll get you up to speed. The short version is that these artists and several others have all asked Spotify to remove their music after objecting to COVID-related misinformation featured on the Joe Rogan Experience podcast, which is a very popular podcast on the Spotify network. In 2020, Spotify signed a $100 million deal for an exclusive license on this show. Now, in response to pressure from artists and also users, Spotify published its platform rules outlining its policies on what it considers dangerous, deceptive, sensitive, and illegal content. These aren't new rules previously used by Spotify internally, but not made public until now. These rules say that Spotify forbids hatred, incitement to violence, sexually explicit material, and, and this one's important, quote, Content that promotes dangerous, false, or dangerous, deceptive medical information that may har cause offline harm or poses a direct threat to public health, end quote. The company will also work on adding a content advisory on podcast episodes that discuss COVID-19. One would think other health-related issues as well, if there's going to be some sort of a, a, a blanket uh, situation going on here. Spotify said that content violating its rules could be removed from the platform with repeated violations subject to suspension or removal from its service altogether. 
These rules stop short of outlining any specific strike system or escalation from removed content to suspension. Yeah, this was uh, uh, dominating my uh, Twitter feed kind of uh, takes on this. And, and it's very interesting because this obviously, you know, Spotify is starting to, you know, by uh, getting this goes to the Joe Rogan experience, buying podcasting studios like Gimlet and others that they've been doing over the mm -hmm. past several years, you know, getting from being a music service to an original you know, increasingly an original content platform and running into a lot of the same problems that, you know, this really seems analogous to a lot of the issues that YouTube had a couple of years ago with that was more associated with brands buying ads that appeared on, you know, shows with with content that advertisers would have preferred not to have been associated with. But, uh, you know, kind of running into that same problem of, hey, we're we're taking podcasts from being this very passive thing to this thing that we're making exclusive, you know, we're, we're putting in this very advanced ad tech to it. And it turns out uh, there are uh, some ways that it can go sideways when you s so closely associate your brand uh, or your, your platform, I should say, uh, with uh, with content like that. Yeah, and I mean, the, excuse, the exclusive license on the show is a big part of this. I'm an Apple mm -hmm. Music user. Uh, I, I fight with my friends all the time who send me Spotify playlists where I'm like, <laughs> what, do you, what, do you, what am I going to do with this? But I, you know, I always say, for the most part, the platforms are more or less the same. Uh, you know, you listen to your music. There's, the, you know, there's, there's certain shows that are exclusive to 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 these and other platforms um, that that host music and podcasts, but it's that exclusive part of it that if I you know I was kind of thinking about this over the weekend if if it was Apple Music and there was some podcast that uh, somebody had you know uh, you know they they uh, Apple Music had paid a lot of money for and it was something that I felt uncomfortable enough that it it kind of uh, mirrored what a lot of people might think the company stands for. And I'm not even talking about the Joe Rogan podcast. Let, let's, mm -hmm. you know, this is kind of hypothetical, but if there was something that I disagreed with enough that I felt really uncomfortable with any platform um, kind of signing off on, right, then I would have a problem with this. Now, granted, I'm not a musician. I don't, you know, I, I, <laughs> I don't have much sway here. Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, they are uh, they've been around the block a while and uh qu qu quite a bit big discography for both and I it, it almost reminds me of the days days of yore when certain artists would uh you know get bent out of shape about a company offering streaming versions of their songs and say no 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 you got you have to buy our music that's all we're doing but this is a little bit different uh because it it is about um, you know, enough people saying this is harmful to us, or we just don't agree with it, and we're gonna make it hard for you, Spotify. Weirdly, this move to it, it, it almost makes Spotify's exclusive podcast strategy uh, uh, make sense on a business decision. Take away the the controversy about COVID misinformation, right? Take away that, but the idea that an artist could say, take my, a very popular artist could say, take my music off my platform. And there are innumerable other options for people that want to use that, that Spotify loses out on, uh, as opposed to controversial as it may be an exclusive podcast that you can only, you know, I, I know there are like video versions, stuff like that out there, but you can only get the podcast version of that on that platform. I, you know, in, in a weird way, the move by artists to take music off the platform kind of validates as a business decision the the pursuit of this exclusive content yeah all right well uh in other shoe dropping news sony announced it intends to acquire the game developer bungie for 3.6 billion dollars sony says the company will remain an independent subsidiary and will be free to self-publish and reach players at its discretion bungie was founded in 1991 acquired by microsoft in 2000 with its halo title made an xbox console launch title and then went independent in 2007 then signed a 10-year publishing deal with Activision in 2010, ending that partnership in 2019. They've been around. It's hard to see this as anything other than a response to Microsoft's recently announced plans to acquire Activision, but we wanted some insight into what this means for the gaming industry at large, so we asked Jen Cutter to weigh in on the news. Don't know about you guys, but I was definitely not ready for yet another major acquisition. 
since we're in the realm of anything can happen, guess I should keep an eye on Nintendo in case they buy Square Enix next. Bungie wasn't in immediate danger of tanking in the years following the slightly tense split from Activision. Activision's insistence on cranking out Destiny expansions yearly put quite a strain on teams and leadership, leading to the breakup. But they certainly had a rocky ride when transitioning Destiny to a free-to-play model, even removing previously paid-for content from the game without reimbursing players, as well as making any remotely cool armor a paid cosmetic rather than earnable in-game. Cause devs gotta get paid. That said, Destiny is not Bungie's only game, just the only one with reliable, consistent news, like the new Witch Queen expansion dropping February 22nd. New IP from the company has been in progress for many years now, with a proper reveal coming in 2025 and, amazingly, still no leaks about it, though future projects within the Destiny universe are expected. With all the consolidation of major AAA developers, is this going to be good for the industry in the long term? Short term, sure. Stocks go up. But will this end up inviting scrutiny like the NVIDIA ARM deal? Right now, all the companies are playing nice and openly honoring previous multi-platform deals. With the Microsoft purchase of Bethesda, Xbox boss Phil Spencer stressed the company would continue contractual obligations with Sony for Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop, but future titles will be exclusive to platforms where Game Pass exists. It even broke today that MLB The Show will now be on every platform, including the Switch, with cross-platform play, cross-saves, and cross-progression enabled. That said, this feels like a honeymoon phase, all press releases and warm fuzzies. The real truth of how this all shakes out won't be seen for a few years, but I think will definitely be felt during this console generation. Sony's State of Play event on Wednesday is going to be lit. <laughs> uh, Jen Cutter, thank you so much for weighing in on this. Both Rich and I this morning saw the news. Well, we all saw the news. You know, we were kind of like, okay, uh, who, sh who, who has a really good inside track on gaming? Jen Cutter. So thank you, Jen. Really, I, really, really appreciate I, that. I wanted to add this much to to this debate, in that one of the one of the interesting things is that as Microsoft has actively pursued the ability to play uh, a variety of games on its service uh, or gaming or, or their hardware as a service, um, it's really removed what traditionally has bounded video games. Uh, to the marketplace and that you had a hardware manufacturer, whether it was Sega, Nintendo, Sony, uh, Microsoft, and then you would have games that would be written for that specific platform and then, you know, released that way. I think what you're seeing is a seminal shift away from a control of the platform and more of a platform as a free-for-all, but we're going to control the IP or at least we'll own the IP in order to make money off of it. If you want to watch a specific show that you can only get on Netflix, you're going to you're going to sign up for Netflix. If you're going to watch a show that's only available on Hulu, you're going to sign up for Hulu. If you're going to watch a show that's only available on HBO Max, you're going to sign up for HBO Max. And I think this is what you're seeing is that we're shifting away from the circuitry in our on our platforms the best, so you're going to buy it to we have the most compelling content, you're going to subscribe. And I think this is what you're seeing right now. And I do think, you know, to Jen's point about regulation, I do think maybe this setting this up again, this is just a press release, so we'll see how this actually works out in business. But the fact that this is a you know independent subsidiary, if that's the if that's the structure, if that's the language that these companies need to start using, you know, to maybe hope that they're gonna pass some regulatory muster. Um obviously, you know, Microsoft has stopped well short of of framing it as that saying, hey, we'll we'll follow the letter of uh, our contracts uh, while they're while they're there. So um you know, and the other thing is, this may not be Sony's only response uh, in that. So we will definitely have to keep an eye uh, for uh, for some more news in this regard. Before we move on to uh, smart home uh, news, just a real quick one. This is just coming in from the wire. New York <laughs> Times has acquired Wordle. Yes, the puzzle game, daily word puzzle game that has gripped the world with its fun ease of use uh we have no word on what wordle was acquired for price wise um uh the the uh the the press release about this said it was uh acquired for an undisclosed price in the low seven figures still seven figures uh but uh yeah congratulations to josh wordle a software engineer living in brooklyn new york uh who released the game uh not too long ago um and probably had no idea that it would explode in popularity <laughs> as it has with myself among many others doing the wordle game every single morning 
And now for are, just one dollar a week, you can keep playing more. Oh my okay. god! And that that that's exactly where my mind went. It's like, <laughs> don't mess this up for me. Just let me play my free game once a day, please. New York Times, I'm begging you. All right, moving on to smart home gadgets. Uh, they're great. I have many of them, but they often require more involved installation than just plugging in a cable, you know, power on, good to go. Walmart is trying to address that reality, partnering uh, par partnering with Angie, you might know them as Angie's List, to offer home services across its nearly 4,000 stores. So customers can book Angie professionals from 150 common home projects, including a wide range of services like mounting a TV, or, you know, flooring and painting your home. Smaller jobs like furniture assembly have flat fees. Larger product, uh, projects get a little bit more expensive, requiring custom quotes. Now, back in 2018, Walmart had partnered with the company Handy to offer in-home installation services in a subset of its stores. Handy was subsequently acquired by Angie later that year. Amazon has offered in-home services since 2015, so Walmart is not alone here. This new partnership, though, with Angie and Walmart will be offered on a broader range of products and will continue to expand in a more complex service uh, agreement to customers. The service goes live in mid-February. Yeah, this is really interesting because, you know, I, I haven't had a ton of smart home stuff, but one of the things that I had was a Nest doorbell. And, you know, that it, it's the one of the wired ones. And just even like I had to reroute some some of the cable that had to go, you know, it, it needed a certain wire to come through that wasn't, you know, present and stuff like that, was able to do that with the help of my father-in-law. But you know, anything more complex with that, you know, we're talking about like smart lighting systems, we're getting into, uh, you know, as, as smart thermostats get more complex, like to get the benefit of a lot of these smart technologies, there needs to be a tighter integration. Um, what, you know, when it comes to, you know, how it's talking to your furnace or how it's talking to your water heater and stuff like that. Um, we, we saw at CES, there were smart water valves and stuff like that, uh, that Moen, uh, I, I believe it was Moen is, is putting out there. Maybe it's Kohler. Either way, those are kind of things that maybe not everybody can do on their own. And I, I think it's really smart to say like, hey, if we're going to be selling this, we need to provide an easy way for people to be able to install that and partnering with a, a fairly well-known, you know, Angie's List, fairly well-known Walmart, pretty ubiquitous, uh, you know, seems like uh, like a smart way to make those a little bit more approachable uh, for people uh, every day and also have another revenue stream, of course. Yeah, of course. I, I, you know, at first I was like, oh, this is like Geek Squad from Best Buy, you know, like yeah. if you, if you, if you want to handle it yourself, perfectly fine. But if you're feeling like uh, a little overwhelmed or maybe you're not familiar with the technology, this is great. When it comes to something like mounting a TV, every time I move to a new apartment, I have to mount my TV. Well, I don't have to, but I choose to because <laughs> I like the look of it. I can't do that myself. If I tried, I'm pretty sure I would muck something up. <laughs> And my landlord would kick me out immediately. That's not really like that. That seems like that's sort of obvious stuff. You know, if you have flooring and painting needs that that's kind of obvious stuff, too. And that's cool. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, we, we were talking about uh, smart home uh, options. Well, and smart home option companies fighting with each other uh, with Rob DeMillo on on last Friday's show. And there are definitely, I you know for sure times where someone might say, I'd really like this to work, but I need a little help setting it up uh, ahead of time. And for those uh, of us who are less tinkery than others, I think this is a great, great call on Walmart's part. Yeah. And I'm just thinking also with just like consumer solar installations and stuff like that, obviously that's like, you know, that could be a roofing company or something like that. But I, I feel like that is an area that's very adjacent to what they're going to be offering that, uh, you know, it, again, we didn't want to talk about smart tech. Uh, that, that could be something that could be a key, uh, uh, you know, growth area for them going forward. Well, listen, folks, uh, here on the Daily Tech News Show family, uh, we like to offer you as much information as you will take from us. So check out Nikki Ackerman's latest installation of her A Scientist in Tech miniseries on how a researcher is tricking rats into thinking they've been teleported and then measuring their brain response as a result. You can find it in the DTNS feed.
All right, well, we got some chip news. The first reviews of laptops with Intel's Alder Lake chips have been released, and these are focusing on the MSI GE76 Raider gaming laptop. That seems to be the one that went out for review uh, for these kind of initial launch of these chips. If you haven't been paying attention to the uh, desktop Alder Lake releases, this is a major new architecture for Intel, mixing performance and efficiency cores like ARM chips have been kind of doing for the first time. The mobile chips range from low-end i5s with eight cores evenly split between performance and efficiency efficiency to the Core i9-12900HK uh, that uses six performance and eight efficiency cores. The top-end i9 was used in the MSI laptop being reviewed, and reviewers are saying the system as a whole is a big leap forward for Intel, obviously beating out its 11th gen chips by wide margins and posting impressive gaming benchmarks. It also has a discrete NVIDIA 3080 uh, graphics card, probably doesn't hurt. Making more headlines is the fact that it also beats Apple's M1 Max chip in performance. The system posted slight leads in rendering tests like Handbrake and Blender, but over a 30% lead in uh, synthetic benchmarks from Cinebench and Photoshop. The only absolute win that I could find kind of researching this uh, for, for the segment was for the M1 Max was in a 4K Adobe Premiere test. It was from The Verge, and they even said that once Premiere updates with better Alder Lake integration, that could well change. So Intel's back on top. Apple's quivering in their brushed aluminum shoes, right? Well, you know, kind of a little caveat here. This system uses three times as much power and has about a third of the battery life as the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Hard to draw too much of a comparison here. Like I don't wanna you know, say like, oh man, you know, these older like chips just really suck down power. You know, the very different audiences for these two machines. MSI laptop is a, you know, it's a gaming powerhouse, discrete GPU, uh, you know, RGB lights festooned all over. MacBook Pro is designed, you know, pretty, specifically designed for creative professionals. Obviously, a lot of other use cases for both machines. Uh, we'll have to wait to see all their like chips not tuned for like this maximum performance use case to get a better comparison for it. But Sarah, you know, for me, like looking at this a couple of years ago, I feel like when like Intel made that first Ultrabook push, we saw like that first gen MacBook Air, you know, we kind of hit that mainstream like question of, you know, have we hit like good enough mainstream performance for like, you just pick up one of these laptops, it's gonna be fine for everyday use. Are we hitting that with with these, you know, Alder Lake with with Apple's latest, you know, M1 kind of Pro chip, Pro and Max chips? How, are we like reaching that on the high end for like what we could conceivably want to use a laptop for at this point? Well, I would I would I would venture a guess that a lot of uh, <laughs> folks listening right now would say I want the best performance possible. Now, like you said, it's it's bit of an apples and orange comparison because uh, the M1 uh, chip is in a variety of laptops. For example, my MacBook Air has an M1 mm -hmm. chip, uh, just over a year old. Uh, love it so much. Best machine I've ever had as far as, you know, the laptop and, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the Mac family goes. Um, but I wasn't that long ago, you know, everyone was saying like, hmm? M1 chip, one to beat. Um, and you can, you can beat that. But it it depends on what you need to use this machine for. And like you said, you know, something that's hardcore gaming is just going to need more more uh, punch overall. And I, 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 I would never, I would never tell anybody like, oh, all you need is the Apple M1 chip. It's, it's the best one ever. And because these things just keep evolving. They always have. They always will, um, to, to some degree. So, so yeah. I mean, I I think that for for folks who follow Intel's um, product strategy strategy and rollout, uh, this is very exciting. Yeah, and I think what's what's kind of cool about both of these products and and kind of just the the I guess comp competition or whatnot. And let's throw AMD into the mix. Uh, they've been really pushing the mo the mobile envelope up until Alder Lake. Uh, is is that we do have kind of a spectrum of options of it's like hey if you want this gaming laptop, which by the way I didn't see in, in any of the reviews like oh it like burned my hand off. It was super loud. The fans were super loud. So it's like yes it is a big gaming laptop, but it's not like you're making this ridiculous compromise when it comes to you know uh, uh, you know convenience features like that. Um, that we have like kind of this big spectrum of really high end stuff, admittedly at very crazy price points at times, you know, both these machines over $4,000 maxed out. Uh, so it, it it is a good time. You know, it wasn't too long ago we were asking like, man, can Intel iterate off of this 12 nanometer process, stuff like that. Uh, you know, great to see them, you know, pretty rapidly bringing Alder Lake to mobile and having a roadmap for being like, hey, we have a, we have a strategy. Uh, clearly the performance is there. Uh, we'll have to see when the more mainstream consumer stuff comes out, uh, you know, how well that scales compared to Apple and AMD, uh, what they're offering. Rich, would you like to talk about pandemics? 
things? Um, you know, uh, nothing would <laughs> actually uh, make me uh, ha- no, never mind. Some things would make <laughs> yes, me happy, but anyway, I know it's, that was a tough one. I'm sorry, that was it, that was a, that least, was a curveball. At uh, least, yeah, at, at least in the U.S. Some of us have been receiving, you know, kind of these free COVID tests in the mail. You know, we got retail supplies of PCR tests, a little tenuous uh, during the current Omicron surge. But while getting tests delivered is great, a new paper from researchers at the University of California, Santa Barbara, outlines a system to perform tests at home using a smartphone. The current iteration definitely has uh, some DIY feel to it. It requires the team's uh, back to count app, a hot plate, a cardboard box, although I think any box will work, and an LED light. To do the test, you put saliva in a $7 testing kit on top of the hot plate. Then you put down a reactive solution that turns red when bonding with viral RNA. You put the cardboard box with an LED over the top of the plate, then place your phone on top of the box. Again, there needs to be like some sort of hole in there to see the color reactions using the camera, uh, using the phone's camera. So plus side, really cheap, aside from, you know, a smartphone. It's in limited trials. It proved as accurate as a PCR test, and it can be easily modified for new variants and other pathogens, according to the researchers. Only downsides, at least right now, this was a limited trial with 50 participants, so maybe that accuracy doesn't scale as we get more people into these, tri- you know, into testing mm-hmm. on this. And right now, the app is only calibrated to work with the Samsung Galaxy S9 oh, phone. Oh man! Phone is probably pretty affordable on eBay, Sarah. I wanted to test. Shoot. Um, I, I actually, I'm, I mean, I'm not, I'm not personally, uh, needing a test right the second today. Many people are. Um, mm-hmm. so having options for this is pretty cool. Um, this does feel like this is not, this is not for the gen pop, right? This is for somebody who's like, okay, I, I understand what you need from me. I have a hot plate, um, and a variety of other, uh, instruments required for this, but but hey, you know, more info is good info. I, yeah, I, oh, yeah, Roger, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, I, as I said at the beginning of the show or, or before the show in the GDI, I, I actually tested positive for COVID, and I have personally gone through two uh, home antigen uh, uh, tests, and this would actually be great, other than the fact that you need to have a hot plate. Uh, but if they <laughs> if they could develop one without a hot plate, because you know, right now there's two there's two there's two tests that you use to to dis- determine whether or not you have COVID. One is the uh, the the quick test, which is the antigen, but it's not as sensitive. So you need to be really like your head needs to be filled with with uh, mucus to 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 get any sort of reading from it compared to a PCR, which is a lot more sensitive uh, and a lot more precise. And you know, just not not having to have to to dance between those two levels of of precision would be a boon, especially in the case of me. I have two kids, or I have I have one older daughter that goes to school. Test them every week in order to let them go to class, and you have to show verification that they mm-hmm. did uh, test negative. This could be a huge help, especially if we can send it electronically, and they're and 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 the uh, and the pos- or not the negative uh, false rates are are relatively low. What's cool about this story for me is, uh, well, one, the idea that you could have just like different reactive agents that you could test for a bunch of different diseases in your home to be like, oh, I got the flu. OK, I better not go to work. But the like I, I think at, in tech, we've kind of just like take for granted now that like, oh, yeah, I just got this smartphone in my pocket, whatever. Like this reminds me of like the first time I saw someone like check email on a phone, like where it's like, oh, yeah, this is a super powerful computer that's in my pocket that's attached to a really powerful imaging system that can be combined to do things that like almost seemed unimaginable before. I don't want to go too hyperbolic on this because again, like this nowhere near being commercialized or approved in any sense of the word. Uh, but like, that's what, th- that's what this feels like to me is like very shows some of the transformative power of the things that we have in our pockets every single day, which is really cool. Well, in the uh, in in the weekend mailbag report, we got a lot of really good feedback um, and 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 some constructive feedback um, on our latest "Live with It" uh, show, which was about the remarkable two. Um, for anybody who didn't catch that in our feed, we offered it to all folks, not just patrons. Um, so do listen to it if you can get a chance. It was me joined by Jen Cutter, um, who is. A real, uh, she's she she probably is the better person to mm-hmm. be to 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 test something like the remarkable too because she writes a lot longhand, 
Anyway, uh, of of the responses we got, and thank you again to everybody who responded, William wrote in with some good points. William said, as a longtime user of their Remarkable 2, I enjoyed hearing your impressions of the device. I think you gave it a pretty fair summary. Great job overall. One thing not mentioned, though, was the fact that Remarkable provides every user with the root password to their device. This allows you to log in and install software apps as well as modifications that greatly enhance the Remarkable 2's note-taking functionality. Uh, William says, I've installed the open source co-reader ebook software, which is superior to the built-in uh, Remarkable 2 e-reader functionality, although you do still need to have removed any DRM from ebooks beforehand. And that is something that Jen and I got into um, in, in our Live With It segment. William says, CoReader has great Dropbox integration functionality, makes it easy for me to open PDFs and EPUBs that I've stored there. Another customization that can be made is to change the sleep screen. I use one that's mostly a transparent PNG, so I can still see the document that I had on the screen before I put it to sleep. This ability is not possible on any of the more traditional LCD or LED tablet displays. In this age of ever more lockdown devices, I think that Remarkable deserves a lot of credit for providing this freedom. It's not for every user, but if you're someone with a reasonable level of technical skill, it's amazingly liberating. Passing out a root password with your devices, though, I, I just imagine like, Somewhere no. there's a security there's, researcher that's like, yes. Can't, can't, can't it, work. As long as you can't can change work, it, as long sure. as you can change it, it's not the same for everyone, that's fine. And, you know, William, you, you do bring up a really good point that that was something that I kind of just stayed away from because I was trying to, to kind of figure out, like, okay, what do we got? Core access. I did play around a little bit with DRM and EPUB just to see if it worked kind of thing. You know, not trying to get in trouble or anything. but um, and, and that is possible, but it isn't always the most obvious method. So I think, yes, uh, for anybody who has thoughts on the Remarkable 2 or uh, e-readers in general, especially productivity devices that are kind of e-readers plus, um, would love to hear more of your thoughts as well. And yeah, keep keep that coming. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also got an email from Jeremy. This was in response to our conversation with Rob DeMillo on last week's show, last Friday's show. Jeremy says, I'm one of the people that has multiple Google speakers in my house that are linked as a group. I see that might be nice to adjust all the speakers at the same time, but I wonder if that's something that really happens. Now, Jeremy is speaking in response to Sono saying, no, that's our thing. Google, you can't do that. You have to adjust all the speakers individually, no matter how many you have. Jeremy says, I have never done that with my group of five speakers. One reason is that not all my speakers are the same. A level eight on my Nest uh, Hub Max is a different volume than on a Nest Mini. The other reason that none of my rooms are the same size, thus needing different volume levels. I don't know how many houses that would have rooms all the same size with all the same speakers. And that doesn't even get into what is in the room that changes those acoustics. I agree though that taking away the choice does suck. And like Rob said, if Google was smart enough to mimic the Sonos system and not copy their implementation, then this is BS. Yes, indeed. <laughs> That's all you got, Rich. I, I, uh, I, I really, I, I, uh, as a Sonos person, I talked about this on the show a little bit last week, but I do sometimes, I don't know if I'm playing music and all my speakers are linked. It's nice to be able to control them all at once, you know, as, as a nest, right? Ha ha, no pun intended. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, Jeremy, I, I agree with you that in many cases, it wouldn't really be something that would, you know, hinder your uh, enjoyment of media. I will say if Google looked at their analytic user data and said, this is a critical feature that many of our users use, they would have paid Sonos a licensing fee to keep it up while they worked on a workaround so that they didn't need to do it. There you go. Uh, yeah. Well, listen, we got some brand new bosses over the weekend, and we would like to thank all of you now. Ilta Adler, uh, Antonio Mendelia, Stephen Wirt, and Bryce Johnson all started backing us on Patreon. Yay! Thanks, Ilta. Thanks, Antonio. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you, Bryce. Y'all the best, and we appreciate you so much. We are live Monday through Friday on this here show, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. If you want to know more, you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we'll be back doing it all tomorrow with our guest, Nika Monford. Talk to you then. The 
This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> <laughs>